darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media and the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment, let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I'm your host, Abraham Hamilton III. And you are listening to the Hamilton Corner. Did I just say that already? I just said it. it was so nice I had to say it twice. But thank you for tuning in to the program. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been, man, what a week. What a week this has been. But thanks be to God uh, that we have made it to this particular day. At this very moment, many of you, if not most of you, are making that transition from your part time jobs where you generate an income to your full-time jobs where you cultivate an outcome. As you make that transition, I want to encourage you to do so with full intentionality, understanding full well that what goes on in your house is far more important than what goes on in the White House. Many of you, very similar to me, and I I had to do this earlier in the week, I think it was Monday, Uh, I was just, I was so wound up. Uh, I had to take a moment, man. I was in the parking lot uh, before I went home. And I was like, Lord, help me uh, to leave the things that are happening in the office, in the office, so that I went across the threshold of my home. I can be effective uh, with the remaining hours of this day uh, to exalt the banner of Christ and to to love on my wife, to love my wife and to serve my children, to serve my wife well this evening. You know, um, I, I'm I'm just growing to the place to where I'm, I'm, I'm endeavoring not to take any days for granted, you know, to see each day as the opportunity that it is uh, to live for Christ, to exalt Christ, uh, to those I have the most immediate opportunity to impact. That would be my wife and my children uh, to make sure that I am wholeheartedly invested in making full usage of that opportunity, opportunity, because tomorrow is not promised. You know, I think about uh, I thought about it uh, this even last night. You know, I'm I'm not trying to be um, doomsday-ish or uh, mundane or anything, but I thought, man, if this is my last night with my family, what would I want to have said to them? You know, not because I'm planning on going anywhere, but just being keenly aware that I am not the governor of my days. The Lord is the governor governor of my days, and I want to make sure that I am um, fully invested, you know, uh, planning for the future, yes, but making full usage of the time that God has given given me in this particular moment. So as you're making this transition, as you're making your transition heading home, man, please do so uh, with full awareness and f- be, be fully intentional about making sure the things that we do today, the things that we do today are saturated with the presence in, uh, of God and invite him to empower us by his grace to be effective witnesses for his glory. Well, we are going to start. In the word of God today, I'm excited, man. I'm, we're going to have a guest on the program. Um, uh, I won't tell you who it is yet, so you got to stick around for that. Um, but before we get into addressing some of the issues of the day, we must, we must, we must uh, make sure we have framed our hearts and our minds with the word of, with the word of God. Uh, so we're going to go to Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 18 through 25. And I want to point out... Um, some of the metho- methodolo- methodology, can I speak? Methodology <laughs> uh, that the scripture reveals. Because uh, I've talked about before the judgment of withdrawal, one of the most um, harrowing notions, uh, in my opinion, is when God steps back and allows man to to suffer the consequences of being thrown into a godless society by man's own volition. You know, I'm reminded of when, when David sinned by numbering his military, it wasn't because God has a problem with mathematics or counting. He's the God of mathematics. There would be no mathematics or science in terms of discipline uh, without God. Um, there's an entire book in the Bible called Numbers. We've talked about that before. 
Uh, but David was trying to flex. He wanted to, you know, bounce his pectoral muscles like he's some kind of bodybuilder based on the quantity of his military fighting men, you know. And long story short, he sinned against God, and the Lord gave him an option as to how he would be judged. And he said, Lord, I'd rather you do the judging because you're merciful. If you allow me to be placed into the hands of men, men are not merciful. And so mankind uh, interacting with one another void of God is one of the most harrowing notions that exists. Um, I'm thinking about the Superdome in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, man. It was, it was, it was, it was horrible. It was horrible. But look at Romans. We're going to go to Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And this is what the Word of God says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasoning or speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in, their lust, in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among, dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. Mm -mm -mm -mm. We've talked about this before, starting at verse 18, when the scripture says it's not that men, is, men are... Uh, in total, ignorant of God's righteous requirements, is that mankind has his penchant for suppressing the truth via unrighteous behavior. Wicked conduct is the vehicle for truth suppression that the Spirit of God diagnoses here through the Apostle Paul. Then he goes on to, to describe a portion of the scriptural uh, dis discussion of what can be known as general revelation. Okay, there are things that God has made evident to mankind that communicate the truth of his reality. But men deny that. And then verse 20 points specifically, uh, having clearly seen, mankind is clearly seen. And then it says, being understood, <laughs> being understood through what has been made. You know, we've talked before. Uh, a lot of people may not know, but the Big Bang Theory is a relatively recent addition to macroevolutionary theory because as proponents of macroevolutionary theory continued uh, to have aspects of the Lord's universe open to them through in technological innovation, they began to realize, ruh -ruh, there was something before what we said was in the beginning. <laughs> uh, you know, if you have energy and matter, you know, that has to, has, an or has to have an origin. You know, you have the Newton's laws of thermodynamics. These things are in operation. <laughs> it's called a law of thermodynamics. And they say, well, how do we explain uh, matter and energy's existence? We know how we explain it. A bang. It was a bang. Okay. So you mean to tell me nothing banged? <laughs> how do you have an explosion out of nothing? Doesn't an explosion require something to explode? I mean, these are, are basic questions, simple questions that require some form of answer, I would suggest. Wouldn't you? So the Big Bang was added because Romans 1 verse 20 is true. They're seeing some things, but instead of giving the divine his props, giving God his props, you come up with, with get ready for this, 
alternative facts. <laughs> then the scripture says, and though they knew God, not necessarily re re uh, indicating a vibrant, intimate, personal relationship, but more a general recognition of sovereign uh, preeminence. It says they neither honor him as God or give thanks. Verse 21 reveals that the consequences for this refusal to honor God and to give thanks to him, to honor God as God and to give thanks to him. The consequences for this is that man becomes futile in his reasoning capacity. His ability to think is diminished, which makes complete sense if you understand that thinking in a human is only possible because of the thinking God who created mankind. So mankind's ability to think <laughs> while denying the author of mankind's capacity to think, would diminish if that refusal persists. You can see how that would happen. Not only was his thinking capacity diminished, but his foolish heart was darkened. And in humanistic hubris, professes to be wise, but de devolve into declaring in his heart there is no God. And they exchange the glory of God, the incorruptible, for an image, and this is what we need to understand. The first um, glory exchange and worship exchange is not from man to animals initially. The first is denying God, man then deifies himself. The scripture t shows us that plainly. In exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. Corruptible man. In addition to transitioning worship from God to man, then mankind also adds to that birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. What is the reason? Why is this happening? Because God has hardwired man to worship. We have been hardwired to worship. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it, the scriptures reveals to us that uh, God has set eternity in the hearts of man. We were hardwired to worship, to find something with transcendent significance and to ascribe glory. God made us for that purpose. But the devolution continues as we go from deifying man and beasts and animals and degrading sexual appetites. Then look at what the pinnacle of it is. Verse 25, for the exchange the truth of God for a lie. The consequences of exchanging the truth of God for a lie is that man who is hardwired to worship, he worshiped and served God the creature rather than the creator. Now you tell me whether or not we're in that very thing right now. The primary means that many people are being denied, um, precluded, um, and uh, even co-opted away from, away from Christ following, science is being used. What's being articulated in science? Oh man, is nothing significant. We're just a glorified animal, a human animal, similar to these other animals. So what ends up happening? A diminishment in man and and an, an augmented view of, of animals. You have movies like uh, Planet of the Apes and all these other kind of things that show, hey, you know, animals have superior morality, superior physical capacity, superior all of these things. We're not much different than them. Look at a man and animal on the same plane. Man moves over into this you know, radical environmentalism, this green worship movement. You, you have to realize that what we're witnessing play out on the global stage in this whole deal about green environmentalism, it is a collision of worldviews. One worldview requires us to view man as distinct within creation and as a vice regent, if you will, given delegated authority by God to rule his earth, to subdue it and rule it, to maximize human flourishing on the earth by taking full advantage of the things that God has placed in the earth for human flourishing. The contrasting worldview deifies the creation. They say man isn't transcendently created and unique within creation. Man is just another indecipherable component of creation. Man is no more superior than the slug. Or the caterpillar, or the bird, or the spotted owl, or the turtle. That's why you can kill babies in the womb, but you better not touch those turtle legs on the beaches in Florida, or you go to Giselle. It's a collision of worldviews. That's why we have to understand our worship must be corrected, and that way our stewardship would be corrected. 
there's something yeah. different about you and I having disagreements yeah. and being upset with one another and having to work through those things mm-hmm. versus like when there's a spiritual attack on our marriage, like mm-hmm. when there's there's something that is overwhelmingly intense that you yeah. you almost kind of feel like that's not usual. That's yeah. not normal. I think when you get to those intense moments like that, you can stop and say, hold on. You know, we're missing each other. Let's pray. Mm-hmm. Like there's something going on here that's beyond a little minor disagreement or, or things like that something greater is trying to take place you know and i think uh the ability to be able to stop and recognize those things man that is the sign of maturity Mm -hmm. uh and that that's what i long for more and more the ability to discern and to see what's going on airing the addisons weekday afternoons at 2 central on american family radio If we choose to live as if we are not made in the image of God, then in a sense, we become free to make ourselves in whatever image that we want. Living as God's Image Bearers, an article by Jordan Chambly. If we are made in the image of God, then the way we think about ourselves and the way that we think about other human beings should be shaped by that truth. Want to read Jordan's article? Visit afa.net forward slash the stand. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. Abraham Hamilton III here. I am just exceedingly grateful uh, to know this brother in the Lord who, in my opinion, uh, is a giant in the faith. I know he would probably not want me to say that, but that is my opinion, (laughs) Um, who is... Uh, the founder and president of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. Uh, This organization is a network of Christian scholars, and I love this, who are saving the planet from the people who are saving the planet. (laughs) They bring together insights of excellent science, economics, theology, and ethics to teach about biblical earth stewardship, economic development for the poor, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. My guest is Dr. Cal Beisner, the author of over a dozen books, many of which are available at the online shop at cornwallalliance.org, and hundreds of articles that also, many of which are available on that same website. Dr. Beisner was uh, the former associate professor of interdisciplinary studies at Covenant College and of historical theology and social ethics at Knox Theological Seminary. He's spoken at churches, colleges, schools, and other organizations on four continents. He holds a bachelor's in interdisciplinary studies from the University of Southern California, a master of arts in economic ethics from International College, and a Ph.D. in the history of political thought from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Dr. Beisner and his wife, a wife of 38 years, Debbie, have seven children and 15 grandchildren. And of all of that, the thing that I am most uh, excited about is that he is a brother in the Lord. Dr. Beisner, thank you for joining me on the Hamilton Corner again. Abe, thanks very, very much. It's my privilege to be with you again. No, the privilege is mine, for sure. And and this interview came about because a friend of yours sent a book to me uh, titled Fossil Future by Alex Epstein. And I have to tell you, this book is an absolute treasure. It's an absolute treasure. I'm going to show those who are watching, show you the, the book that I'm talking about, Fossil Future, and... Uh, and just kind of exchanging emails with you about the book, uh, we agreed to do this interview where one of the major, well, let me say it this way, the major push from Alex Epstein, Alex Epstein's book and what I know uh, about you and the Cornwall Alliance is that when you have a mindset that human flourishing is the objective, it causes you to have a different approach to the conversations we're having in our in our nation at the to, at the moment about climate, I, I just want to take a moment to welcome you to share with our listeners the divergent views between people like you and Alex Ep- Epstein who view uh, our approach to climate from a human flourishing perspective as opposed to um, kind of an anti societal or environmental impact perspective. Would you unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, Yeah, uh, this is actually one of the things that made me the most excited, Abe, about Alex's new book, uh, Fossil Future, Why 
global human flourishing requires more oil, coal, and natural gas, Mm -hmm. not less. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, uh, (laughs) during the month of August, we are glad to send a free copy of this book, hardback book, 460-some pages long. We'll send a free copy of this as our way of saying thank you uh, to anybody who makes a donation to the Cornwall Alliance, 100% tax deductible of any amount, and asks for it. All they need to do is go to cornwallalliance.org, click on the donate button, and follow through. That's the way to do it. And if you ask for a copy of Fossil Future, we'll send you a free one. Uh, and by the way, in this month of August, because this is our 17th birthday, uh, anything donated gets doubled. It's mm. matched by some generous donors who pledged to do that. Anyway, here's, here's the deal. Uh, the vast majority of the environmentalist movement operates on uh, a, a worldview, a uh, narrative uh, framework of saying that uh, what we need to do is to minimize the human impact on the earth. Uh, it's a sort of a, an assumption that nature knows best. Mm. That nature is best untouched by human hands. Uh, this is often uh, conveyed in a sort of a formula that was developed by Paul Ehrlich, famous for his book, The Population Bomb, back in 1968. The formula was I equals P-A-T. That is impact on nature, which is assumed always to be negative, right? Impact is always negative. It's not not beneficial. That's the assumption. Is uh, a, a consequence, a result of the combination of population and affluence and technology. Mm. So the more people there are, the greater will be the impact, the harm done to nature. The more affluent those people are, the greater will be their harm to nature. The higher their technological development is, the more will be their harm to nature. So for most of the environmentalist movement, the aim is to minimize population and affluence and technology. (laughs) <laughs> basically to return <laughs> us all to a sort of a hunter-gatherer sort of living where we live supposedly in harmony with nature. Now, the problem with this is that, is that it sees nature as, first, very delicate mm. so that it's easily harmed, uh, brought into catastrophic problems. And second, it is, however, though delicate, naturally nurturing that really helps human beings. If we would just learn to get along with it, everything would be peachy keen. Now, if you really buy into that, I think you should welcome the opportunity to be uh, dropped naked in the middle middle of the Brazilian rainforest. No tools, no clothes, no nothing. And you should just be happy there. Or in the middle of the uh, Amazon desert, or in the Mm. middle of the uh, Arctic. Mm. or in the middle of, frankly, any place in the world. Uh, (laughs) Your life expectancy from the moment you're dropped (laughs) is going to be pretty short. Yes. Because that's just not the way nature is. Now, a biblical worldview, the Christian worldview, tells us a very, very different story. It tells us that nature is uh, robust, resilient, self-regulating, self-correcting, Uh, really capable of enduring some pretty serious uh, strokes, (laughs) serious uh, harms, and recovering. And we know that from uh, thousands of years of nature's history. Uh, We see, for example, after uh, Mount St. Helens blew back in, what was the year, about 1980, something like that. Yeah, the 80s. It was in the Uh, 80s. It it wiped out thousands and thousands of of, uh, acres, millions of acres of forest all over, all of that area has grown back beautifully and it's, it's just wonderful. That did more devastation to that bit of land than anything humanity has ever done to any other bit of land anywhere, anytime. And so we, le- we know first that nature is not delicate. Mm. It's very robust, it's, it's very <laughs> uh, resilient. But second, we also know that because of the curse that God put on nature, it is not actually all that nurturing. Uh, when God put Adam and Eve into the Garden of Eden, I would say, yeah, that was a very nurturing place. And yet, 
even before the fall, God had said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue, subdue it, it. Yeah. and have dominion yeah. over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and everything that moves on the face of the earth. And then after we fell into sin, God had said to Adam that now, by the sweat of your brow, you'll eat bread. Why? Because cursed is the ground because of you, thorns and thistles it will bear. Mm -hmm. And so what we know now is nature is not un un uh, not best untouched by human hands. Nature can be improved by human hands and must be improved by human hands. So instead of thinking I equals PAT, impact, meaning harm, is population times affluence technology, we think instead uh, that that E equals P-A-T. E stands not for impact, but enhancement. In the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation, we say that the call of humanity through Genesis 128, the dominion man mandate that I just quoted for us, the call of humanity is to enhance the fruitfulness, the beauty, and the safety of the earth to the glory of God and the benefit of our neighbors. Mm. So we're addressing the two great commandments to love God and to love neighbor. Mm. And we do this as we multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it. That mm. means that we have to have a growing population to fill the earth. It's nowhere near full, by the way. Right. And we have to have affluence because of a, a, a safe, beautiful, healthful environment fruitful environment is a costly good, and wealthier people can afford more costly goods than poorer people can. And we have to have technology, advancing technology, because it's that technology that enables us to subdue and to rule the earth. And for these things to happen, we need two things. One is a set of five social institutions, private property rights, entrepreneurship, uh, free trade, limited government, and the rule of law. And the other is access to abundant, affordable, reliable energy, because energy is what's necessary to do any work, and work is what's necessary to make food, clothing, shelter, and everything else that we need. Mm -hmm. That's where Epstein's book, Fossil Future, comes in so handy, because Epstein explains that in order for us to have that abundant, affordable, reliable energy, we have to use fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Fossil fuels and nuclear and in the appropriate locations, run a river hydro on major dams. Those are the only things that we have that can provide that abundant, affordable, reliable, instant on demand, 24-7, 365 energy power that we need. Mm -hmm. Wind and solar and other so-called renewables can't do it. Now, I wanted to ask you, and I... I've never asked you this this question before, uh, but where does the the name Cornwall originate for the Cornwall Alliance? Oh, yeah, Cornwall Alliance. Well, back in 1999, the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty, good friends of mine, and good friends of yours, mm -hmm. um, arranged a colloquium of about 35 scholars on environmental stewardship, and we met together in a research, uh, retreat center in. West Cornwall, Connecticut. Ah. Uh, after that meeting, we, we had three great days of conversation, but really there was no plan for anything in particular to come out of it. And then a handful of us got the idea, hey, let's, let's try to summarize in just two pages the basic principles that we discussed there in those two days, uh, two and a half days together. And so we drafted up uh, declaration, and eventually we had 1,500 signatures from religious leaders and scientists and economists around mm -hmm. the world, and we released that in March of 2000, and we called it the Cornwall Declaration Got it. on Environmental Stewardship. Since then, it's been endorsed by many, many thousands more people. And when we started this organization in 2005, uh, we eventually decided to call it the Cornwall Alliance the stewardship creation. Mm, I got it. So what what I first of all, first I believe and agree with you. So I believe this. So I'm not just presenting this as a question that I'm detached from, but what I know you believe, what the Cornwall Alliance believes and advocates for, 
what Alex Epstein Alex Epstein believes and is advocating for is just in the subscript of his book, Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Oil. I'm going to say that nice and slowly and loudly. More oil, more coal, more natural gas, and not less. Clearly, you can appreciate that that assertion is a – uh, is a is not the popular view in our contemporary culture. Why are you so persuaded that even in the face of uh, the overt deluge of assertions to the contrary, that this is what is necessary, more oil, more coal, more natural gas uh, to optimize human flourishing? Well, for a number of different reasons. Abe. Um, the first is simply that in terms of the cost per kilowatt hour of electricity generated or the cost per mile that you're able to uh, drive a car, a truck, a plane, a ship, etc., oil, coal, and natural gas, together with nuclear and, in certain locations, uh, hydro from major dams, these are just the least expensive means of generating that power, that flow of energy that is absolutely essential to lifting and keeping any any whole society out of poverty and to raising it up to greater and greater levels of prosperity. Um, it's, it's much, much less expensive than the alternatives of wind and solar, which are intermittent. You know, the sun's not always shining, the wind's not always blowing, and uh, they're not not really all that predictable. And so we need steady, instant-on-demand uh, energy at scales in, in quantities that are just beyond the imagination of the vast majority of people. Uh, and wind and solar just can't, can't get there. And yet those are the ones that are being recommended by people who say, well, we have to fight global warming and <laughs> carbon dioxide emissions from burning uh, oil, coal, and natural gas are causing global warming. Mm -hmm. The next reason to favor these fossil fuels, in addition to the fact that they're less expensive, uh, especially when you include in the counting of the cost the enormous subsidies and tax incentives that wind and solar get, uh, it's something like 900 times as much per kilowatt hour for wind and about, or, or let's see, and, and about 300 times as much per kilowatt hour for solar, or reverse those two moment in my mind, <laughs> forgetting which one is which, but uh, much, much higher government subsidies. And of course, all government subsidies really come from the pocket of taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So that's who's paying for it. But also, these are much better for the environment. Uh, mm. Fossil fuels are. You have to move, mine, much greater quantities of earth to get the uh, rare earths and the uh, metals that let, are necessary. Let me jump you there, cause jump in there, cause the break is about to grab us. But we'll pick up with this when we come back. The AFA Resource Center has all your favorite items, everything from books, movies, shirts, and even hats. Introducing AFA's polyester and twill hats, starting at just eighteen dollars. Whether you're into fashion, a collector, or you're just having a bad hair day, these hats are just what you need. You can buy one for yourself or a friend. Purchase your AFA hat today at resources.afa.net. Picture a stormy sea. The waves are rolling viciously and the sky is darker than night. The crack of thunder can be heard over the roaring wind. A tiny ship is thrown wildly up and down as it rides the waves. The crew is just about to lose hope when someone spots a sudden flash in the distance. A lighthouse. Lighthouse for the Lost, an article by Parker May. To read this article, visit EngageMagazine.net. Hamilton Quarter podcast and one minute commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner, where my guest is Dr. Cal Beisner, founder and national spokesman for the Cornwall Alliance. Uh, if you would give uh, to their ministry 
any amount, you can get a copy of this book that I have, Fossil Future, a hardback copy by Alex Epstein, which I believe, um, it, I don't just believe it, it is a fact that this book is a treasure and it will aid you in having a better grasp uh, and a better understanding on what's really going on with the popular conversations about climate and it will arm you, especially if you have, have a biblical worldview, it will arm you with the technological understanding as best as possible to utilize that, uh, that worldview to say, listen, fossil fuels are not something we should merely tolerate. Uh, it's something that we should advocate for its expanded usage for the greater good for us obeying the Lord's instruction to exercise his dominion, uh, to exercise dominion over his, his planet, and also to aid our neighbors in, in lifting people as much as possible, the broadest and largest amount of people out of poverty as possible so that they can join us in our responsibility uh, to subdue and rule the earth. It is a great, great, great resource. Their website is cornwallalliance.org. That's C-O-R-N-W-A-L-L-A-L-L-I-A-N-C-E dot org. Now, Dr. Beisner, Dr. Beisner, the disrespectful music caught us <laughs> as you were explaining, uh, providing your answer before. Would you mind continuing the answer you were offering before, the, before we went to the break? Sure, yeah. Of course, the first reason to favor fossil, fossil fuels is that they are inexpensive. They are mm -hmm. affordable, whereas wind and solar are far more expensive, especially when you include the massive government subsidies and tax incentives that come with them. Second reason I was starting to get into is that, frankly, you have to move a whole lot more earth. You have to do a whole lot more mining to get the rare earths and metals necessary to build wind turbines and solar panels, which, by the way, wear out reasonably quickly and need to be replaced again and again and again. And when they wear out, you wind up with a bunch of toxic waste that we haven't figured out how to recycle yet. Uh, but you have to do all this mining to get this. Uh, much more mining, much more movement of earth than for uh, oil and natural gas, for sure, and even more than coal. Mm. As far as the amount of earth you have to move per unit of energy generated from that. But then, in addition, uh, most of the uh, cobalt and lithium and, and rare earths that are used in building solar panels and wind turbines come from China or the so called Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, it's not democratic and it's not a republic. It's <laughs> basically a dictatorship. So, you, so, so you're saying the U.S. Congress the named, named their nation? That's what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, right. The, the mining in both of those locations is done either by mostly child labor in the Congo or by slave labor from, uh, by Uyghurs in China. And then uh, besides that, the Environmental protection regulations in Congo and China are practically non-existent compared with those in the U.S., where we ought to be mining things instead. And then finally, too, uh, there's this benefit, this, uh, this side benefit from using the fossil fuels. We not only get 85% of all the energy the world uses today from fossil fuels, and that gives us light and heat and cooling and transportation and all the medical devices in our hospitals and all these different things that use, that use energy. We not only get 85% of all that energy from them, which enables us to have food, clothing, shelter, medical care, education, transportation, communication, and all the other things that make life wonderful for us uh, on a physical level. Mm -hmm. Of course, much more important is the spiritual level of the gospel and knowing Christ. Mm -hmm. But also, there's a side benefit from using the fossil fuels, and that is that when we burn them to get energy, we also release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Now, some benefit? people are afraid that, that carbon dioxide is causing dangerous global warming. The fact is that even the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which tends to be quoted as the great authority in these things, tells us that at the end of this century, even if we did nothing to reduce CO2 emissions, 
human beings would be far better off, multiple times better off than they are right now, which means that the temperature is not nearly as important as our energy, our technologies, things like that. That's why people can live anywhere from the Arctic Circle to the Sahara Desert, the Brazilian rainforests to, uh, you know, Mississippi here in the United States, where you are, right? <laughs> people can do this. But the benefit of added CO2 in the atmosphere is this, that plants use it for photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. For every doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere, you get an average 35% increase in plant growth efficiency. They grow better in warmer and cooler temperatures and wetter and drier soils. They make better use of water and soil nutrients. That's, uh, they, they therefore expand their range into warmer and cooler places. The uh, growing season lengthens as the last freeze comes earlier in the spring and the first freeze later in the fall. Mm. Uh, and, and plants improve their fruit to fiber ratio as well as their resistance to disease, to disease and pests. The result is more food for everything that eats plants and <laughs> more food for everything that eats things that do eat plants like mm -hmm. us, right? We mm -hmm. eat you know, cattle and chickens and things like that. So this is especially important for the world's poor because it makes food less expensive for them. So this is a win-win situation. And frankly, the fossil fuel companies around the world should not be apologizing for their products at all. Mm. They should be saying, look, we provide 85% of all the energy that you use. You pay us for that. Thank you. We appreciate that. But we also provide these this carbon dioxide that improves the growth of all the plants around the world, including on farms, raising crop yields, making food more abundant and, and affordable for everybody in the world. And you don't pay us for that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> this should be the attitude of the fossil fuel companies instead of apologizing for their product. And that's what, uh, that's what Alex Eckstein in Fossil Future is getting at when he talks about arguing to 100 he's saying mm -hmm. stop conceding anything mm -hmm. insist here is the great benefit of this product of, of fossil fuels and i wish that i could get some major leaders in the fossil fuel industry to grasp this uh, because if they did, maybe they'd want to support the Cornwall Alliance for the stewardship of creation. <laughs> we get accused from time to time of being in the pocket of big oil or big coal or big gas or something like that. I can only say, I wish that would make our budget a whole lot better. <laughs> but nope, still waiting after 17 years for my first ever check from Exxon Mobil. That that that's amazing. But but you're so right, and and. And as you mentioned, in Alex, Alex Epstein's book, Chapter 11, Reframing the Conversation and Arguing to 100, to 100 yeah. he, he literally makes, makes that statement. Uh, he, he said, for too long, uh, these companies have ceded the moral ground to those who have dedicated themselves to eliminating the fossil fuel industry. You know, he, he, quote, exactly. he quotes in the book specific CEOs from the Shell Corporation and others who agree that they need to be moving towards what's so-called – uh, net neutral or zero carbon futures. He's like, no, that's not what what we need to do. What what do you think needs to happen in order for this not only to come from the fossil fuel companies themselves, but to and I, and as I'm listening to you and reading through Alex Epstein's book, the thing that continues to come back to me is that man, you know, I call them Goebbels Inc. The 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 media and even some of uh, the literature and some academic outlets have done a great job of propagandizing the society into making uh, Cruella de Vil out of fossil fuels. When you actually read the data, do the research, you know, uh, the, in terms of the temperature warming, Alex Epstein cites the, the statistic that within the, within the last 170 years, the temperature has increased a grand total of one degree. I mean, this is insane. But we have this yeah, climate yeah. catastrophism and we have even young people who are, you know, developing anxiety disorders because of the climate. You know, you have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and other people going yeah. out and saying, hey, we have five years, we have 10 years. We have to do something about this. What do you think has to happen in order to change the lexicon in our in our popular discourse on these 
on this this matter? How can we arm the public with this information so that they can even be able to assert the moral case for the increased usage of fossil fuels for their personal consumption and to aid uh, the poor around the world in having a, a greater opportunity uh, to move from impoverished conditions to more, as you mentioned, uh, affluent circumstances? Well, a major part of it, I think, is getting the book, Alec Epstein's book, A Fossil Future, Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Oil, Coal, and Natural Gas, Not Less, into as many hands as possible. That's why we're offering to give a free copy of this hardbound 360-some page book to anybody who makes a donation, 100% tax deductible of any size, to the Cornwall Alliance during the month of August and asks for it. All they have to do is ask for it. Uh, they can do that at cornwallalliance.org, cornwallalliance.org. Just click on the donate button and fill out the form. And when you reach the comment section, ask for a copy of Fossil Future. Uh, they can also uh, subscribe to our email newsletter. It comes out a couple times a week, always educational on these things. Yes. But let me point out this too, Abe. In addition to the benefits from all the energy that we get from fossil fuels and the enhanced plant growth from the added CO2 in the atmosphere, to the extent that CO2 does make the lower atmosphere of the Earth warmer than it otherwise would be, and I certainly agree that it does that. That's pretty basic physics. Uh, to the extent that it does that, what's exciting is that even the warming itself is overwhelmingly beneficial, not mm. harmful. Why mm. is that? It's because the kind of, the way that greenhouse gases like CO2 warm the earth is that they warm it primarily toward the, the, the poles, not the equator, primarily in winter, not in summer, primarily in the nighttime, not in the daytime. That is, they raise low temperatures much more than they raise high temperatures. And indeed, the highest temperatures, they, they don't really raise at all. So the increase in global average temperature that you mentioned, about one, maybe 1 1.2 degrees Celsius over the last 170 some years, has happened primarily by raising low temperatures, not by raising high temperatures. Well, why is that so beneficial? First, because it expands our growing region farther toward the poles and higher in altitude into colder areas that used to be too cold for mm. growing. But second, and even more important than that, it reduces cold snaps while not increasing heat waves. But heat waves, uh, pardon me, cold snaps kill on average about 20 times as many people per day as do heat waves. Mm. So the warming itself <laughs> is a benefit, not a harm. And what we've got in terms of the environmental movement that wants to panic everybody about warming is this assumption that somehow or other, prior to the beginning of this warming period around 1850, the, the world's temperature was optimal. Well, that's just crazy. We have no idea what would be the optimal temperature for the world, but I can tell you this much. The temperature now is much better than it was in 1850, and for the several hundred years before that, a period that we refer to as the Little Ice Age, mm -hmm. uh, when global average temperature was about one and a half to two degrees Celsius lower than it is now, you had uh, winters that just destroyed uh, civilization, uh, crops all over the northern hemisphere. You had summers where the growing season was so short and the temperatures were so low that crops failed and you had tremendous hunger. That little ice age ran from about 1350 to 1850. And it was during the early part of that that the Black Plague killed off somewhere between a quarter and a third of the whole European population. And most of that death didn't come just from the plague itself. It came from the fact that with the low temperatures, crop yields were so low that people couldn't get enough food to energize their bodies to fight the disease. Mm. During the medieval warm period, from about 950 to 1250, things were very different and population flourished. And ladies so and gentlemen, warming itself is good. 
These are the type of insights that you could expect to receive when you subscribe to receive the newsletter from the Cornwall Alliance. I would encourage you to do so. I have found my aptitude increase tremendously as a result of being a subscriber, subscriber, getting the information. And if you go to CornwallAlliance.org right now, make a gift of any amount, you can receive Fossil Future by Alex Epstein. Y'all have a great day. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio.